Sudan saw in President Omar Hassan al-Bashir for another five-year term in office on Tuesday, the 2nd of June, effectively extending a 25-year stint in power already. The thing is, though, on his watch, Sudan has lost an enormous part of its revenue, especially after the split with South Sudan. And, of course, it's also lost an enormous part of its oil deposits as well. So is this another case of same script, same cast, or same cast, different script? We'll have to wait and see. We'll be looking at the economic challenges ahead for Omar Hassan al-Bashir in this edition of Global Business Africa. Here's what else is in the pipeline. Rules regulating child travel in and out of South Africa kick in and they're raising fears of losses. Also in tourism, Tunisia is forced to rethink its strategy after the attack on the Bardo Museum in Tunis. Right then, he's been in power for well over two decades. But on the 2nd of June, 71-year-old Omar Hassan al-Bashir was sworn into office once again for another five-year term. He's been successful so far at remaining in power, but the economic challenges he's facing is, are daunting. As Yasser Kim reports from Khartoum, with inflation at well over 20 percent, unemployment also over 20 percent, the task ahead for Mr. Bashir is anything but easy. The cessation of Sudan into two states and internal strife have had its toll on the economy. Oil revenues, the main source of income, dropped by 80%. The result is the lack of investments, high unemployment, high budget deficit and mounting debts. Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir made it clear fixing the economy is a priority. But it will not be an easy task. There is a five-year plan to increase production and improve the quality of our products. It's not an easy target to achieve self-sufficiency in several goods. We then should export our surplus of production to attract hard currency that will support our balance of payments and control the currency depreciation. What makes matters worse is the international embargo on Sudan in response to claims of genocide against al-Bashir by the ICC. But China has given a major boost to Sudan's economy. It is Sudan's largest trade partner and investor. China has diversified its investments lately, not just in petroleum, but in other sectors, for example, building a new airport for Sudan. There are signs of improvements. National revenue increased from 24 billion Sudanese pounds to 61 billion since 2011, a big leap with diversification in sources of foreign currency. And not just petroleum. Petroleum exports amount to only 2.5 billion. Islamist leader al-Bashir is also working on improving relations with his Arab neighbors, notably oil-rich Gulf states and Egypt, to guarantee more trade and investment opportunities. The Sudanese people are feeling the burdens of the economy, but as experts say, all efforts for reform will not succeed unless al-Bashir creates internal stability and ends the international isolation to attract much-needed foreign investments. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Khartoum, Sudan. Now, new visa rules that came into force on the 1st of June will cost South Africa's tourism sector around $800 million a year. That's according to sector players. For the government, however, that seems to be an acceptable loss, given its continued defense of those rules. It argues that they needed to end child trafficking. Sumitra Naidu takes up the story from Johannesburg. South Africa's $10 billion tourism industry contributes around 9% to the country's GDP. It's a significant employer and is about the only industry that's been constantly growing. With South Africa's economy at its weakest levels in over 20 years, many are very concerned new rules on children traveling to and from South Africa will cause more strain. Travel agencies are expecting a 20% drop in ticket sales. If we then look at that in terms of the value and we consider at the same time other bookings or services that passengers will book, hotel accommodation, possibly tours, uh, um, cruises, charters, et cetera, et cetera. The potential revenue lost for the travel agency and tour operating sector could exceed easily 8 billion rand per annum. The new travel rules were first announced in 2014, but after being inundated with complaints about readiness, the Department of Home Affairs delayed the deadline for almost a year. From now on, parents traveling with children under 18 will have to produce an unabridged birth certificate, 
Additional documents will be required when children are traveling with one parent or by themselves. We are now requiring all children when they travel in and out of South Africa that we would have a way of, of, of ascertaining whether your travel is legitimate, that you are not being trafficked by anyone, and that, the, and that your parents are aware that you are traveling. According to some in the travel business, the new rules are making South Africa a harder sell to tourists. When a big part of the consumer responsibility lies with the front-facing travel agent, and that travel agent is actually not sure of policy requirements, they will start to off-sell or down-sell a destination. China Airways was due to start direct flights to South Africa in May, but postponed its entrance into the market until October, citing the recent xenophobic attacks and the new travel rules as reasons for the delay. We clearly think South Africa is, a, is an amazing destination um, for people out of China, and we were showing positive, strong 30% year-on-year growth before these absurd regulations were put in place. But the Department of Home Affairs says the new laws are important to protect children and are here to stay. The issue of us safeguarding our children should be there. So, so what we would do is uh, we, have, we have listened and, and we are in, 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 in consultations with, with, other, with other stakeholders around this matter. And uh, it's something that's keeping us constantly busy. So we have implemented, the, we will come to a stage where we will have to review and say, has it been effective, does it work? The new laws means more work for parents, but it's being implemented in the best interests of children. There were some concerns about the backlog at home affairs with the application and issuance of unabridged birth certificates. But the department has confirmed that it's fast-tracked the document process and its backlog is almost clear. In terms of the impact these new laws will have on tourism numbers, well, it seems that's a cost that government is willing to live with if it means protecting children. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV, Johannesburg. Right, and onto a pet topic of ours here on Global Business. Between April and May this year, the dollar rose by over 5% against the Kenyan shilling. Now, as it closed on the psychologically important 100 shillings to the dollar mark, Kenyan sense of panic only grew in tandem. In East Africa, though, the shilling actually isn't doing too badly. You see, Uganda and Tanzania both are having a far worse time. What might have accelerated the slide in May, however, was a directive issued on the 4th of May by the central bank that banned currency trading desks among banks here from dealing with offshore brokers. And the same directive also cut banks' foreign currency exposure ratio limit in half to just 10% of core capital. By the end of May, however, the shilling lost ground to the dollar at its fastest pace so far this year. And policy has now been reversed. But in order to understand its importance and how it fits into the wider context around the dollar shilling rate and its slide, I spoke earlier to Sankul Mandavia, the Director of Treasury Operations at NIC Bank. They may not have received the correct information at the start when they made their first decision and then after watching the market, um, I think uh, they realize that the brokers are really a help to the market rather than a hindrance. Walk us through this. Let's assume for the sake of argument, you're explaining this to a two-year-old. Yes. What, what's the importance of having these offshore brokers in the market? What's, what's the value they bring to the table? B brokers bring uh, transparency to the market. For example, if a customer was looking to buy perhaps $5 million, $10 million and went directly to the banks, you'd suddenly have 10 banks all looking for $5 million. That means you'd really have an order of $50 million that would, didn't really exist. If the customer goes to the broker, the broker shops around for a price, gives levels, and banks can fulfill orders through the book. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot safer, it's a lot more transparent. There's a fair amount of price discovery through brokers, and uh, you can see already the central bank let them back in and order seems to have been restored to the market. Would it be fair, therefore, to argue that given the concentration in terms of assets and market share among Kenya's banks, that if you lock offshore brokers out of the market, that just contributes to this cycle of pushing the shilling um, into deeper and deeper losses against the dollar? Exactly. That, what happens is you have no price discovery. So you may go to bed at 95.50 and wake up at 96.50 suddenly, despite there having been no deals done. Um, let's move on to the 7th of April. Uh, the government of Kenya issued this 
interesting Gazette notice that effectively shut down 13 hawalas uh, right across the country. Did that have an effect on the dollar shilling rate? Okay, I am not privy to the numbers, but f I can fair make a fair guess that those hawalas had almost zero effect to this on this market. Mm. Um, I don't think collectively they were turning over anything more than 20 to 30 million dollars a month. Uh, they were negligible. So to put it mildly then, we would essentially say that the effect of the closure would have been overstated completely. Yeah, it was completely irrelevant, you know, either way for us. Why is it that, and I, I remember putting this question to the central bank and they said they couldn't give me a precise breakdown on the market share between MTOs like MoneyGram and Western Union and these hawalas on the other hand. What, as, as someone who's worked in the banking industry, why is it so hard to get data that effectively breaks down market share and says this company is carrying this much in terms of remittances? Some of them don't have returns. Some of their transfers may not be um, through normal channels. They may be a little, some transfers may be done informally. It's difficult to tell how much they really contribute. I really don't think they had any real effect on the market or, or, or the exchange rate in any way. All right. Um, let's move on to the 9th of June. Uh, the Monetary Policy Committee has moved forward its uh, previous um, meeting. Beyond raising the central bank rate, what else can they do? I think um, the MPC has done the right thing so far. They gave uh, a tightening bias. Um, they did not uh, raise CBR. Uh, the currency continued to move and uh, at this stage they've called an, an extraordinary meeting and I suppose they might raise CBR. Mm. Um, they have to accept the fact that the dollar has strengthened globally. Mm. The shilling has done well against our regional partners. If you compare to uh, our regional exchange rates, uh, you can even take a guess and say we might have strengthened against a couple of currencies rather than weakened. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at this stage it would be smart not to panic too much, uh, raise the rates a little bit, uh, try to bring some level of order to the market and then let the shilling find its, uh, its level as naturally as it should. Quick run through the market here for you. Let's see exactly what your money's been doing across the board. The Kenyan uh, NSC 20 starting the week off on a positive note, uh, as it were. However, the more, not this trend will remain in force as another matter altogether. Uh, keep an eye on resource stocks as well. Down south in South Africa, Harmony Gold uh, wants to minimize losses at one of its mines. NUM, as you will recall, has warned that about 3,000 jobs are on the line. But that's a sector-wide problem. The squeezing between costs on one hand and the decline in revenues on the other. We'll be in Harare next. Vendors have been given seven days to clear out of the streets. And Cape Town is all set to hold the World Economic Forum on Africa. We'll have the details shortly. Effects of the austerity measures are evident and were expected. Egyptians, however, seem to be patient about it. But El Sisi told government he wants to control the prices promptly before people's patience runs out. Welcome back. You're still watching Global Business Africa. Let's take you over to the Zimbabwean capital of Harare. Street vendors there have been told to clear off. Local authorities are trying to clean up the city's image and to formalize its economy. The street vendors, however, say with rising unemployment, they'll be left destitute. They have nowhere else to go. As Farai Mokhtoui reports, the vendors have been told they must leave before Sunday. Whether it's high fashion, the latest tech, 
of fresh fruit and vegetables. It's all available on Harare's pavements. Vending has become the only way to make a living for many who've been pushed onto the streets by growing joblessness. But their livelihood has set them on a collision course with local authorities who want the city cleaned up. Last December, the city of Harare started sprucing up this space, repainting it and introducing artwork as part of an inner city renewal drive. But this is not the vision they had in mind. This whole area has been overrun by hundreds of vendors and all the beautiful artwork now going unnoticed. A seven-day ultimatum to ship out has riled vendors who see their survival under threat. Half a loaf is better than nothing. I don't make much, but at least if I come on the streets and vend, I can make a dollar. That's more than I could have gotten sitting at home. Right now we're having xenophobia in South Africa. Some people, uh, some of our fellow brothers, they're coming from South Africa, coming here. There's no industry here. So what do you expect for them to do once they're here? I want to be told here is a job for you before I move off the streets. The city says it has. 14,000 stalls have been set up. Not enough, though, for the 20,000-plus vendors. With no let-up in sight, some here are already planning for the inevitable. I will move into the smaller towns and suburbs and start selling door-to-door. -door. But that could push up operating costs for a business that has small margins and that thrives on the CBD's heavy human traffic. A previous attempt to expel street vendors failed after First Lady Grace Mugabe ordered that they be left alone. But that was last August, before their numbers had reached the current levels. There are vending sites named in her honor, and some who do their business here told me they want her to come to their rescue again. Farai Mwakutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Also on the continent, over 1,000 leaders representing national governments, international enterprises and civil society organizations are in Cape Town, South Africa for the 2015 World Economic Forum on Africa. Now, the thing is, several heads of state this time around have skipped the event altogether, partly because the African Union Summit is being held next week. But there is a record number of multinational companies attending. Angela Coppola has a preview of the forum, which turns 25 this year. Many delegates and panelists are already in the mother city, attending meetings on the sidelines. From Wednesday, however, delegates will be listening to presentations which are focused on the theme of the event, which is reimagining Africa's future and finding ways to use past lessons to create solutions and sustainable jobs and grow economies. This year's event has attracted a record 85 multinational companies, which is a clear signal, the organizers say, of an investor appetite for the continent. It is expected that the major investment deals that will be clinched will be clinched on the sidelines of this event. The South African government delegation, on the other hand, includes ministers and deputy ministers and will be led by the country's president, Jacob Zuma. There's sure to be some tough meetings as the minerals minister may have to explain the current impasse around black economic empowerment in the mining sector. The performance of Africa's leading economy, Nigeria, is also expected to be in review at this forum, despite the notable absence of its new leader, Muhammada Buhari. Key questions, though, will be his ability to turn the country's fortunes around. South Africa, as the host nation, is also keen to use this forum to push African Union development and that agenda. Civil society actors, on the other hand, are keen to lobby for investors to allocate more of their corporate responsibility resources towards supporting South Africa's or Africa's social economic development, especially in the areas of health and education. In Cape Town, for CCTV, I'm Angelo Coppola. And of course, he and the team, Norma Kugus down there, Sumitra Naito's down there as well, will all be giving you all the latest details from WF 
from tomorrow all the way through to Friday. Quick run through commodity prices now. Um, interesting news coming from both ends of the market. Angola's oil minister ahead of the OPEC meeting on the 5th of June believes that $80 a barrel is a relatively fair price for crude. Clearly, as you can see from those numbers, we're far from there. And the supply glut still essentially continues. OPEC supply uh, in April was at its highest level since September 2012, about 31.2 million barrels of crude a day, despite, keep in mind, a 60% cut in the US rig count. We'll be focusing on tourism once again, this time on Tunisia. It's rethinking its marketing strategy after the attack at the Bardo Museum. tell the African story differently. You know, Africa is known from the conflict, hunger, starvation, whatnot, the, the bad things. Yes, there's that going on, but we also want to project Africa in another light. We want to bring out the positives. If it's in a conflict, if it's in an election, we're able to give a level playing ground. Well, I'm a field reporter or correspondent, if you like. From a young age, I always wanted to, uh, to know what's happening in the news. I wanted to read newspapers. I was actually reading for my folks the newspapers. I've covered um, general elections, I've covered conflicts uh, in the entire African continent. I was thrown into the deep end when I got an assignment to go into Somalia. That was quite the experience. I think that was my first conflict zone to cover here at CCTV. Going to Somalia opened me up, opened up to me the world of war correspondency and since then I've been able to go to several other places like the Central African Republic. I've been there three times. Uh, the conflict there is different from what we've had in the past and we've had experiences where, where we've been attacked. You have to realize whether you're cut out for this and you want to go ahead with all this. So I can say it's a career that is uh, not for the faint-hearted so far. But as soon as I'm given a story to do, um, that passion, it ignites something in me and I get excited when I see my package or my production on air. And then I know that I'm actually doing maybe what I was called to do at some point. The only way you can actually highlight and highlight somebody, some of these issues is through doing what we do. So certainly it's worth the risk, but then again, I keep saying no story is worth my life. I'm Jane Keo, I'm a reporter for CCTV Africa. Africa is not one country. And Africa is not one story. But as Africans, we do share one belief. What more offensive in a that whatever the challenge, we will overcome. CCTV Africa brings you unrivaled coverage. From the fight against Ebola to the fight for greater freedom. From the figures seeking your vote to the figures shaping your economy. This is Guy Henderson reporting from the jungles of East. And all the reasons to celebrate the diversity of life on this great continent. Welcome back to the program. Let's head over to Tunisia. Once upon a time, it had a very, very vibrant tourism sector. Today, though, it's in decline, especially in the wake of a brutal attack at a popular tourist destination in the nation's capital earlier this year. That attack at the Bardo Museum only makes it much harder for those in the sector to recover from the damage inflicted by 2011 revolution. As you're about to see, however, Tunisia's tourism sector is now revising its marketing pitch from the ground up in order to recover. These beautiful Tunisian beaches and hotels are usually packed with tourists. It's the beginning of the high season, but figures from the Tunisian Central Bank show numbers are down by more than 25%. Many within the tourism sector believe the slump is even more dramatic, with visitor numbers falling by more than 50%. The industry blames the attacks at the National Bardo Museum in Tunis in March which saw 21 people killed, many of them foreign tourists, when gunmen opened fire at one of the country's most important tourist sites. 
It was a major talking point at this year's national tourism show in Tunis. The reason for this is a Bardo attack that has been a thorn in the side of tourism in Tunisia. After the democratic transition, we thought we were going to be at our highest this year. But unfortunately, we had this Bardo attack, which will somehow delay the tourism reflation, but it won't stop it. Tourism has been suffering since the 2011 revolution in Tunisia and despite parliamentary elections last year and relative political stability, the industry has never recovered. Tourism is crucial to the Tunisian economy, representing over 7% of its gross domestic product. The government is working to boost tourism, with the Ministry of Tourism launching a series of international advertisement campaigns. But industry groups say training initiatives must also be a key component. We have to work on the quality of our services, insist on trainings and also bring back this positive dynamic and give back hope to the people who work in tourism. That's the most important thing. They have to believe again and put all their know-how and their energies in this sector. Some tourist operators, however, are unhappy with both the government's and tourism organisation's efforts, believing they focus too much on short-term solutions like promotion and international support, when it's Tunisia's unique brand that needs to be developed. If you want to improve tourism for the 22nd century, you need to define a specific product. Believe me if I tell you that a couple of years ago people came here and they didn't even know whether they were in Tunisia or in another country because of the similarities with the beaches. Whatever the strategy, it's clear something needs to be done to reverse the current trend. Just over 6 million people visited the country last year, down 3% on the previous year and 12% on 2010. Andrew Thompson, CCTV. Right then, let's wrap up with a quick run through currencies here for you. The current shilling miraculously well behaved today. It's no longer the enfant terrible of uh, the currencies that we look at. Just under 97 shillings to the dollar. We're still keeping a close eye, of course, on the 9th June uh, MPC meeting. Interesting news from South Africa, though. A rate cut in the near future? Unlikely. That's according to the South African Reserve Bank. The argument they're making is that the case for a rate hike has essentially, to use their word, evaporated. Well then, here's what we're working on for tomorrow's programme. The World Economic Forum on Africa turns 25 this year, opened up in Cape Town, South Africa. We'll add the details, we'll be live on location over there. We'll also be looking at a foreign direct investment on the continent. Project numbers are down, but the values are up by 136%. We'll be looking at uh, Ernst & Young's African Attractiveness uh, Investment Survey later on tomorrow. But, as always, that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. We value your feedback, your thoughts, your ideas on what we should cover on the show. Global Business Africa at cctv.com is the email address for you to use. And, of course, as always, when we're not on air, Facebook and Twitter are your ports of call. We'll see you in 23 hours. I'm Ramanyan.